Hi, this week I'm going to reveal to you 10 of the most closely held secrets in the professional audio industry. It will come as no surprise that the industry as itself is becoming increasingly concerned about the state of progress with VSTs and general home studio technology, that they're worried that their historical industry is quickly evaporating. To counter that, there's quite a bit of knowledge that the big name engineers are holding on to that they never want released to the public. Today, however, you're going to learn 10 of those secrets. So let's go. The first one is the definition of treble and how that can be utilized to your benefit when EQing. The definition of treble, if you look at the Oxford Dictionary, is that it consists of three parts. It is threefold. So if you look here, there's three times as much or as many, or if there are three sporting victories, completed a treble for the horse's trainer. So what does that mean for EQ? Well, if we look at a spectrum and we pick a point, so let's say in this case 50 hertz, there is essentially a yin and a yang of that frequency. So if we consider the yin of the base frequency at 50 hertz, the yang of that, or the polar opposite if you like, is three times treble that amount. So a quick maths calculation is 150, which brings you over to here. Clearly though, that's very much in the mid range. So you need to move it across to essentially where the treble starts and that's around the 1000 Hertz mark. So we have 150 times by 10. So that gets to 1500. And why is that relevant? Well, if we take an example, we have this royalty free track that I've found that I'm just going to use for the purposes of this demonstration. Let's play this back and see if we can spot anything wrong with it. It sounds quite good, but I think it's lacking a bit of low energy, specifically around the 50 Hertz region, which is why I called that out. So let's boost the 50 Hertz region and see, see how it sounds. I think that really adds a lot of depth and presence to that to the bass. I think that's really how it should sound. When EQing though, it's preferable always to cut rather than to boost. It's quite clear why when you're boosting, you're artificially adding frequencies. It's it's obviously doable, but it's not as clean as, as cutting. So this is where the yin and the yang come in. Instead of boosting at this frequency, we can cut at the frequency that we identified earlier. So let's play this back and I will cut and let's see if we get to quite a similar result. I think that sounds really quite good. That's much cleaner without the boost. Let's play it back again so you can listen. Or if we do the previous one. Very similar, very similar sound, but without the potential muddiness of boosting, boosting the low end. Why would the professionals never tell you this? Well, they want to retain that knowledge and they want you to come to them. They want to justify their fees. Rightly so, I get it, it's an industry that's dying. They want to retain the knowledge, but I'm of the view that knowledge is for everyone. This is what YouTube is for. So here you go, let's have it everyone. Now moving on to the next one, which you may have heard the reference of, it is called the smile curve. So what is the smile curve? Again, I have just a royalty free track that I've chosen as an example. Let's play this back. So quite a nice cruisy house loungy type of sound. I think you would refer to that as kind of a, a happy vibe. You would listen to that in summer while out having a few drinks. But what the smile curve is, is if you take a node on an EQ and you dip the mids, you're essentially creating a smile in that EQ curve. 
like in this example here. Obviously the middle point of the node is up to preference. See if we, let's play it back and we'll find somewhere that sounds good. So you would do this as the name implies to add a bit of summer or happy atmosphere to a track. You're adding a smile to it. You're making it kind of a happy vibe. And as you can see, when we do this, you can see that the highs really are more pronounced, the lows are more pronounced, but it takes away that the muddy mids. It's a lot clearer, it's a lot more suited to the happy summery vibe that we're going for. Conversely though, if we have a darker track, like this metal one here, let's listen. Super cool, super cool. Conversely though, we don't want this to have a happy feel. We want it to have a more menacing, darker feel. So we can do the opposite. We can add a node, we can expand the cue, and we can add a bit of a frowny face. So let's play this back. So by boosting the lows there, or mid lows, it adds a lot more darker energy to the track. Next on the list is balanced cables. This has to be the most highly misunderstood concept out there. When you're recording hardware and you consider that the only thing connecting the hardware itself to your interface or your recording device is two set of cables, then you realize the importance of the quality needed in those cables. But what if your left cable is different to your right cable? Well then inherently you get a difference in signal between the left and the right. So if we take three cables that you can see here, one, two, and three. We need to make sure that two out of those three cables are perfectly identical to each other to ensure that the quality is the same from the left and right. So to do that, we ensure that they're balanced. Ignore the cup. The only reason the cup is there is to ensure that the cable itself doesn't touch the desk, which obviously that would interfere with the measurement. Let's put the first one on the scales. And we have 14.39 ounces. Remember that. The second cable. Fourteen point four three ounces. So there's a difference between the first and second cable. On to the third and final one now. Fourteen point four three. So that is the same as the second. So we know the second and third cables are exactly the same weight. They are therefore balanced. We should use those two cables to record our hardware. Now to prove this concept, I have a TR909 kick drum, which I recorded from my TR09. Using those three cables, I used the balanced pair and I used the unbalanced, so the, the higher weighted one and the lower weighted one. So there are two channels, there is a balanced recording and an unbalanced recording. If we listen to the balanced first, basic 909 kick, let's listen to the unbalanced. They sound very similar. You would never hear that in a blind A-B test. However, when we do some further analysis, we go down to the channel splits. I have the balanced group here. What I've done, I've split the left and the right channel out. That was just done using the project convert tracks, convert track to mono function in Cubase. So I have the left and the right. If I play this back now, It's exactly the same as you heard before. <clears throat> However, if we go into the right channel, or the left, it doesn't matter, and we do invert phase, and then we play this back, there is dead silence. We can hear the left and the right playing, but in a balanced group, there is nothing coming through there. Just to be sure, I've added a pro Q, and it's 100% dead silence. There's not a peep coming through there. Remember, this was using the balanced cables. They are exactly 
the same. When we go to the unbalanced group, let's have a listen to this. No difference whatsoever on first listen. However, if we take the right channel and we do the same, we invert the phase of the right channel and now play back just this group. There's a little click there. I'm not sure if you're picking that up. So what I've done is I've put a pro cue on. So, and it's almost as if it's another little mini kick coming through. So we have a disparity there between the left and the right channels. Now for something that needs to be as powerful as, and as centered and as monoed as a kick drum, that just won't do, having that the discrepancy between the left and the right. That is going to cause all manner of mixing issues and mastering issues later down the road. Like most things that can probably be fixed in the mix, you can we can take either the left or the right channel, but that's only a band-aid. It's, it's much better with these things to get it right at source. And for the simple one minute job of actually balancing the cables beforehand to make sure that they're perfectly aligned, absolutely worth it. It will save you money and time. This is why I said at the start that the mixing engineer or mastering engineer will charge you hundreds if not thousands to sort these issues out post mix. But if you sort them out in advance, well then there's nothing for him or her to do. Moving on to the fourth one now, which is the importance of setting your sustain levels right when sound designing. You need to pay attention to what the sample rate is of your interface. Most people I know record at 44.1. I personally record at 48. A lot of professional studios are 96. It's up for debate whether you can actually hear the difference between all of those three, but that's not really a topic for this time. But why do studios and those who record at 96 kilohertz, why do they say that it's better quality? Well, the reason simply is that the dynamic range is higher. The dynamic range at 96 is double that of 48. So if we know that that is our dynamic range, we need to ensure that our sustain level, it only goes down to that maximum value. I personally, as I said, I personally use 48 kilohertz. So when setting my, my sustain lower point, I put that down to minus 48 dB. If you're using 44.1, you need to ensure that it's minus 44.1. And just to prove this, if we go down to sustain, Go all the way down to the bottom. You can see it really tops out. I can't go any lower than 94. If I go a little bit further down, it goes down to zero. So the bottom level of that, of the sustain, is 96 dB. In a professional mastering situation, you might have heard engineers talk about adding dither. Dither is essentially fixing that issue. If somebody has recorded this with the wrong sustain level, then dither essentially adds back a very, very low level of white noise to mask that. And without doing so, you get all manner of quantization issues when rendering this to a digital file. Obviously it can be done, that dithering can be applied, but like all these things, it's much better to get it right at source to increase the quality and also to reduce the work of the mastering engineer later. Once again, this is what they don't want you to know. Moving on to the fifth one, which is the Q parameter in an EQ and the importance of knowing what it is and how to use it appropriately. Here is just the one of the tracks, one of the loops that I had going earlier. Let's listen back again. So it's that kind of cruisy house one that we had earlier. If we open up a EQ, you might have wondered when we select a node, you have the frequency, quite self-explanatory, the gain, self-explanatory, and what is this mysterious Q dial? Well, Q simply stands for quality. And if you think about this in your day-to-day -day life, if you try to handle multiple tasks at once, it's really quite burdensome and you simply can't devote all your time to, to each of them. But if you narrow them down and you focus on one, then you can apply a lot more concentration and a lot more effort to ensure that that one is correct. And the same concept applies to an EQ. If we have a wider band here, then this EQ is trying to manage all of these frequencies all together just with that one parameter. And it just simply can't do it. But if you narrow the quality control, then this EQ is just focusing on this tiny little band. So it's able to devote a lot more of its resources just to that one band. And the quality improvement is ginormous. This used to be an issue with hardware EQs when you had maybe a handful at the very, very most hardware EQs in the studio. 
But now when you can load up a plugin and you can add as many instances of the plugin as your processor will allow, then there's no reason why not to use very narrow Q bands in all scenarios. You can just keep on adding them as you go along. And if you run out, ProQ I think has a maximum of 23 or 22. So it'll take a while before you get there. But even if you do, just add another instance and add more bands. But just ensure that the queue is very, very narrow, just to ensure that the, the equalizer is working in those bands as well as it possibly can. Next on the list is tube distortion and how that is so incorrectly used in the industry. There are no audio examples in this one, just, a, just an explanation of the differences between tube and valve distortion. They are not the same thing, despite how many people will tell you they're the same, they are very much not. If we look at the one on the left, which is the black box from Plugin Alliance, you can see that this models a valve design. The valves are hidden behind these windows, and when you overdrive the circuit, then that leads to some really pleasant saturation that tames the highs and boosts the lows and just gives a nice warm overall feel to the mix. And this is why they're so coveted in professional studios. These first came about in the 40s and 50s, but as time went on, the valves themselves became very hard to source and very expensive to produce. So slowly they disappeared from the market and they were replaced with tubes instead. Now a tube is essentially a model of a valve. Inside the hardware has a series of quite lengthy tubes that run inside the unit that simulate the sound of these valves. The more you overdrive the unit, the more these tubes have forced air going through them and it creates a similar, very similar sound to overdriving of the valves. Whether or not they sound any better or worse is just personal preference. Obviously you have some that sound better, to, better than others and each has their own use in a mix. I think it's interesting to note though, if you're using an emulation of a tube amp, you're essentially using then a emulation of an emulation. You're emulating a valve from a tube. That one's just a bit of pub trivia for you that may or may not come up in your nerdy Christmas quizzes. The next one on the list is the origination of the octave specification that you see on many synths. If we open up the Minimoog here, you can see when we tune the synth, we go from two all the way down to low. Most synths have a numbered range here. Not many have low, they go from usually two down to 32. You might think that this relates to the imperial unit of measurement of feet, but that actually is not the case. When Bob Moog was designing the Mini Moog, he calibrated this according to his own personal feet. So if you look at the upper range of two feet, there's a length of pipe cut out to be exactly the length of two of his feet, and it was tuned accordingly. Similarly, we go down to 32, that is a length of pipe cut out to be equal to 32 of his feet, and that was tuned accordingly to get the lower range. And then so on and so forth for each of the octave ranges here. That bit of information doesn't necessarily help you with mixing or mastering, just a bit of, again, pub trivia for you that may or may not come in handy. Right, now moving on to the next one, we have syncing the LFO rates to the BPM quickly and easily. If we look at the serum patch that I have, it's very basic, just for the purpose of this demonstration, I have just a LFO, triangle LFO on the filter. Let's play this back, nothing special whatsoever. With a lot of digital synths, we are quite spoiled in that we have the BPM functionality here, but many synths don't have that. So in that scenario, if we take this off, the way to sync it to a one quarter LFO is to take off the BPM and then we simply type in the BPM off the track. So this is a 142 BPM track. So I do 1.42 and then we have the LFO synced at 1.4. And now if I play this back, we have exactly the same as what we did before. We have a LFO perfectly in sync at one quarter. So a very quick, very easy way to ensure that you're perfectly in sync, even without a BPM function on a synth. Number nine is multiband dynamics. If we open up a multiband, now this is another tool that's become really quite bastardized and used for the incorrect measures in the last few years at least. Originally a multiband compressor was designed for compilation albums. A compilation album is obviously many bands that have different singles. You might have 10 or 12 different tracks from different artists over a single album. So how do you get them to sit together so it's a cohesive mix? Well you use multiband compression. 
So by using this, you can apply the dynamics of say a metal track against a pop track, against a funk or a reggae track, so that you have each track from one to the next all sounding quite cohesive and that none of them jump out as you play the entire mix back. You may have heard professional engineers say that they try to avoid multiband compression whenever possible, and that's exactly why. It's not designed for this purpose, but it has become used for this purpose. Instead, if you're working on an album that will have some of your friends' tracks on it, or a, a various artists' compilation, then by all means use it. That's the exact time that it's meant to be used. And the tenth and final one is the etymology of the word tuner. For those who don't know, etymology is simply a fancy way of saying, where did the word come from? Amazingly, the audio word tuna came from the tuna fish. If you're not aware, a tuna fish emits an incredibly stable and constant pitch, and it is note perfect. The term then for keeping things in tune came from this, and it was called to tuner it. That over time became tune, and then the device that you use to tune your instrument was called the tuner. It was only in the late 19th century when the spelling was then changed from tuner with an A to tuner with an ER. So I really recommend you go and look on YouTube, try and find some videos of the sound, the noise the tuner makes, and just see how perfectly constant the pitch they are, and then you'll understand where that name came from. It makes perfect sense now. So there we have it. I hope that information helped, and I will see you again shortly. Bye-bye.